Okay, we are recording. So if anybody doesn't make it, they can catch up with this. Um, which I'll remind you, I'm trying to do. I've missed a couple of lectures, but you know, um, somebody was emailed me the other day saying, "I'm so sorry, I couldn't get to the lecture." And it's like it's fine. You know, we're in crazy land. I'm trying to record the lecture, so if you can't make it, that's fine. I think it's a little bit better um, if people show up because that way I can see your faces and know if you're getting it. Well, not right now because you're all black, but. Um, uh, but that is a real help to me because some things you guys get and I, and I don't expect you to get them really quickly and you get them really quickly. And other times there's something I expect you to get really quickly and nobody gets it right away. And I want to go back and repeat myself a couple of times so, or, you know, try and say it a different way. Um, it's really interesting how different that is with every group of students I've got is uh, it doesn't, you know, any group of students will get things a little differently from the group before, partly because I teach it a little differently, but also just because everyone sort of, um, I don't know why, it's classrooms have their own personalities that are different from the people in them, and I've never really understood. So it's really nice for me to be able to see you all. All right, so let's uh, remember where we were before Easter. Um, now today I'm gonna say, today is a kind of a whirlwind, um, a uh, tour of several bits of physics. So we're gonna try to clear this, uh, clear this hurdle today. Um, this is stuff which is on the homework, but I'm not going to be testing super hard. I want you to understand this at the level of like a multiple choice test, but there's probably not gonna be a lot of emphasis on this in the exams. However, this is a necessary step so we can get to the other side of that river, which is really important. And in fact, today, I'm thinking today or early next time, we're going to get to the most important fact in this course. And I want, but to get there, we're going to have to uh, cross this river. We're gonna have to walk on some stones. I'm gonna do this faster than I usually do it. So we have more time to work on the things I really want you to be able to do. And I'm, you know, but this is a really important part of the story we're gonna be doing today. Okay, so before we do that, though, I want to talk about something practical. So let's go back to where we were before the break. So let's share the screen, the visualizer, so you guys can see what I'm doing. Okay, so uh, let's give myself a little more altitude here. So last time we were discussing Lenz's Law and Faraday's Law. So Faraday's Law is that I can create an EMF in a loop if I have a changing flux. Let's focus on that. And Lenz's law says, and so this is if I have, uh, so if I have a magnetic field and I have some area in that magnetic field and it changes, so let's say I have a smaller field over time, that's a change in the magnetic flux, where magnetic flux is B times A times cosine theta, right? It's how much field I have and how big my loop is, how big my, my bit of area is. And so if this has a change, then this creates an EMF, which is to say I get a voltage or a current running in this loop. If this whole thing has a resistance R, then I get a current of the EMF divided by the resistance of that wire. So I get a current running in the loop. And the second one is Lenz's law, which tells you the direction. Now, this one tells me the direction, but only if I understand all the sign conventions, which frankly, I never can. So I'm not gonna bother doing that. I'll just remember Lenz's law. And Lenz's law tells me that the EMF generates a current such that it tries to resist the change in flux. So the flux is into the page, and becomes less into the page than the current attempts to create more field into the page. To create more field into the page, that would mean that it generates a current in that direction. So Lenz's law tells you which way it's gonna go, and this is Faraday's law. Now today I wanna to get to, uh, the first thing I wanna discuss is a practical example of this, which is a transformer, which is something I touched on at the end of class last time, but I'd like to go through in more detail, partly to hint at some of the physics that we're skipping, especially in chapter uh, 29 or 30 
and inductors. We're skipping a whole bunch of really interesting material and very important material for electrical engineering, which I know you guys probably aren't gonna get into in a lot of detail, but you should know about the existence of this stuff, even if you don't know it in detail. So let's start off with something. So let's start off real slow. Technology on technology. <laughs> okay. So I'm getting some B's and some A's. Which way is the current going through this? Up or down? Up or down? Up. That's up, right? So the current's going this way. So the current's going around in this direction, clockwise. So if I loop my hands clockwise, my thumb points into the screen or into the, into the paper. Oh. Okay? All right. So being really straightforward here. Okay. Um, oh, some of my slides got ruined. I just changed these. So this is point. This is a wire. Okay, lots of D's. Nick, can you tell me why it's D? Uh, I said it was D because both of those parts are connected by a conductor, like they're not going through any resistance, so there's not any voltage drop. Right, that's exactly right. I put all the resistance here, and so these things can be very low resistance, so there shouldn't be any voltage drop. And these guys are all like bad equations, right? So. Uh, so in this circuit, now this rule is going to change on us, which is why I'm highlighting it right now, is where the, is the stuff we're going to do talk about today changes that rule. And the reason is, is because right here, we've got this voltage supply, which is just constant over time. And so everything we've learned so far about circuits involves things that are constant over time, where I'm not changing the voltage, everything stays the same all the time. The current uh, keeps running through and doesn't change anything. But now we're going to start looking at systems where that's not true anymore. So, so now I'd like you guys to get out, a, get out a book, and I'm going to have you make three plots, one above the other. So this is the first one. So here, I've got, instead of a battery, now I've got what's called an alternating current voltage supply. And what that means is that this is a, this is a supply that creates a voltage that's sinusoidal. It goes up and down over time with some maximum voltage, right? And we're all familiar with sine waves from all of our work doing um, simple harmonic motion and all that stuff. Um, and this is, in fact, the voltage that you would get out of a generator, which we discussed last time. And the generator is what you get if, you if you're flipping around a coil in a field. So if you take a coil and you flip it around in a field, it will generate an EMF that looks like this. So now I'm going to take that EMF and I'm going to run it through this guy. So what happens to the magnetic field? Now, if you're like me, what you should have just sketched for yourself was this. Is that the magnetic field will be going up and down the same as the voltage, right? Now, there's probably a sign convention here, whether we mean into the page or out of the page for positive or minus, but I don't really care about which way is which. I just know that the magnetic field, when the voltage is going one way, the magnetic field is going to be into the page, and when the, magnetic, and when the voltage is running the other way, the magnetic field is going to be coming out of the page. 
because as I change the voltage, I'm changing the current through the resistor. So when this side is higher voltage than this, that's positive voltage, then the current will run clockwise. And when I'm down here, the, uh, this voltage is higher than this one, and the current will run the other way. And if the current runs the other way, then the sign of the magnetic field flips. So the field is flipping into the page, out of the page, into the page, out of the page. And right here, for instance, this is where there's no current, there's no voltage, so there's no current, so there's no magnetic field. Everybody with this? We haven't done this in person, so this is one of these things I'm not, okay, so everyone's nodding, thank you for that. All right, so now, I wanna put this second green coil on top of the first one. What will I measure for the voltage between these two wires? But I want to see it in comparison to these two. And if you can hold your book up to the screen, that's great. If you can't, don't worry about it too much. I just want you to go through the act of thinking about it is the main thing. Let's see, Aaron's got something. Uh, yes, that's correct. People are working on it a little bit. So instead of trying to sketch it, I'll show you a better answer. So maybe I should finish this off. This should be something like that. Right, you want to take Faraday's law says that we want to take the negative time derivative of the flux. But here, the flux is the field times the area, but we aren't changing the area and we're not changing the angle. So the only thing we're changing is the field. So these two things are just constants that tell me how big this guy is. And then I'm gonna take the negative time derivative. Well, here the time derivative is big and positive, so I make a big negative number. At the highest point, the time derivative is zero. So there I have no EMF. And here I have a very rapid change and that's a very rapid change in EMF. And that is to say, the time derivative of a cosine is a sine. So I get a sinusoidal output. Now the size of these things are all different, right? These are all in different units and different things. And so I don't know anything about, so I'd have to work out what the size of the, of the vertical axis is. But this means that this will happen. Now, if I just replace this with a DC supply, with a battery, none of this would happen, right? This thing would be flat, this thing would be flat, and this thing would be flat and zero because the time derivative of so if that's my b, then dB dt is zero. Right. Oh, ah, can't quite quite enough here on my screen. So we've got to, uh, so that's why running an alternating current is useful because now what happens is, is by running a voltage into the, into the black loop, I can now get a voltage in the green loop, even though the two loops aren't touching, the wires don't have to touch. All right, so we can work out the, the magnitude of this, right? Just to go through that um, a little more formally, the, the uh, EMF that I see in loop two is gonna be negative d flux dt b from loop two. And the flux is equal to the b times the uh, b times area, which is b times a times cosine theta. With this thing, this thing's 90 degrees, right? So this thing's just gonna be one because I've, because I've put my loop perpendicular to the field. The field's always straight out of the page or straight into the page. So it's always at 90 degrees or minus 90 degrees. So this thing's always equal to one. Um, so this guy and the area is the same. So B is the only thing that's changing. So if I want to take D flux DT, that's just going to be A times cos theta times DB DT. 
Okay, so what we see is going to be negative a db dt, where this is the field in the second loop. But how we've arranged it is the field seen by the second loop is pretty much exactly the field seen by the first loop. We've got these wires sitting right on top of each other. The loops are almost closed and they're, they're basically right on top of each other. So the, so the field seen by one is gonna be exactly the same as the field generated by the other. There's gonna be a tiny, tiny little difference, but we could always set it up in such a way like we wrap the two, we wrap the second wire right around the outside of the first wire or something like that. We could play different games to, to get this condition to be exactly right. So this is the field in loop one and loop two. Okay. Now, of course, we could do this. We could play several different games here. One game we could play is that we could add more loops to loop two instead of having loop two just be a single loop, right? So it wasn't, instead of just doing this, we could do that and make two loops. In that case, what it would happen is that now I've doubled my area is one way of thinking about it. Instead of one flat surface, I've got two flat surfaces. And so I've doubled my area. So in this case, E2 would be equal to negative two times A times dB dt. Because I've, or and to put it another way, the first loop generates a voltage and then I connect it in series with a second loop and voltages add. And so I get double. So if I had N turns, E2 is going to be equal to negative N A db dt. And similarly, I could play a game with the first loop as well. I could add more turns to the first loop, so I also increase b with the number of turns on the first loop. So I could play a game here about how these two things are affected. But before I do that, I want to stop and think about this for a second. So I was asking you guys in the warm-up, um, let me see, can I I'll zoom in here manually, manual zoom. Um, so the first question was, um, so, in, so we're looking at these transformers. Loop one creates a magnetic field that is felt by loop two and creates an EMF in loop two. So why is there a time derivative? Which everybody understands, it comes, it comes from Faraday's law. The change in current induces an EMF directly proportional to the rate of change of the acting current. Rates of change, uh, uh, rates of change are functions of time. Uh, this is due how long how long the current in the loop is in the changing flux based on the current and the amount of turns, right? That the, that the amount of current that we get in the second loop or the amount of EMF, which is the better way of thinking about it, we get in the second loop is determined by how much the first loop is changing. And so changing over time means a, D, means a D by DT. Now, now here's the tricky bit, and I don't think anybody really got this. Uh, what, I think a lot of people didn't understand what I'm asking. So in the same part, assume loop one is made of zero resistance wire, which is kind of what we've been discussing. It's a very low resistance wire. Now, why is E1 not zero? So that is to say, this question. Let me just show me what you're thinking. Having read the book and thought about this. All right. So you're answering A, and what's the reason that you're answering A? What's the, what's the principle at work here? Somebody. I guess I'm thinking that the, there's nothing that really would cause more voltage to come through a and B, um, if there was a battery or something connected or AC current connected to the green loop, then maybe that would be a different case. I see. Okay. So, so the, it's coming, but it's coming from the basic rule we had, which is any two points on a conductor have to be the same voltage. 
right? That any two places have to be the same voltage. Which, and remember how we got to that rule. We got to that rule because we said that you can't have an E field inside a conductor because an E field would generate because a, delta, a voltage is equal to a change in E, right? So if I had an E field, if I had an E field, I'd have a change in voltage. And there can be no E fields in a conductor because all the electrons have moved to their final positions and canceled out any electric field that's in there. All the electrons will have moved around and kept it so that I can't have an electric field in there. So that logic is completely correct right up until the point we have things changing. And so what I'm doing now is I'm actually introducing, I have introduced for you a new rule and you have it and uh, it's not quite, all the implications of it aren't quite there yet. So here's the thing. It's true that, and, and some people did answer this on the, um, on the warm up that the loop two could be doing something to loop one. And that is indeed something that happens. And that's a real important effect when designing uh, circuits like this, that loop two, if there's something going on with loop two, it will create a field that, that's felt by loop one. But it's actually more subtle than that. And th the reason is here that what's happening is, is because we're doing things in this loop, there is in fact a voltage here. There is something different, even without the green loop there. And that's a very, and I, you know, to be honest, I don't think I, I think it took me years to really understand this, to really get my head wrapped around it. I can do the math, but getting my head really wrapped around it, I think I, it's taken me many tries before I've completely gotten there over time. So if you're slightly puzzled by this idea, I was in exactly, I remember reading about this when I was an undergraduate student and being, this is the place in first year physics where I just like stopped understanding what was going on. So you're in good stead, but I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. Because even if you don't understand it, you can at least, you'll, you'll still believe me probably. So the thing is, is I wrote this equation down um, for say E2 is N times A times dB dt. Or I could just write this as negative N times d flux dt. I could write it that way. But the thing is, is this rule is a universal rule. Faraday's rule law applies no matter who is generating that field. This tells you if there's a changing field, if there's a changing flux in the loop, then there is a voltage on the wires that are around that loop. And what that tells you is that in this case, because it's changing, there is in fact a voltage difference between A and B. What is it? It's this. It's the same as this. Is that E1 is going to be equal to negative N d flux dt. This is the EMF seen by loop two. This is the EMF seen by loop one. And this is going to be the same thing as voltage AB. There's going to be a new voltage here. It's like a battery here. And if we work out the rules for it, the voltage of this battery is opposite the voltage it would have been. So for instance, if I'm at a moment where A is plus 10 volts and B is minus is zero volts, the EMF will create something that will actually fight this and try to, try to flip it back the other way. It'll actually create a volt, it'll, it'll decrease the voltage across that gap. I'm not gonna work through that in detail, partly because uh, it's complicated and partly because I don't care about it very much. But here's the important point, is that both of them see an EMF. But this thing is the same in both cases, because we've got the loops still covering the same area. Right? The two loops are still looking at the same area, although one of them might be wound around a few times around the same area before it comes out. They both see the same flux. And so they both see the same change in flux. And so that tells me that E1 over N is equal to E2 over N2, whoops, sorry, because these two things are the same. So, D flux DT equals E2 over N1, negative D flux DT is D1, is, uh, let's see, over N2, E1 over N1. So that gives me this.
if I have, so what does that tell me? Okay, now this voltage here is coming from somewhere and we could be, but by pushing on it, we can change this voltage. By, by changing our power supply, we can change this voltage that's going in. So we can change this voltage is going in. And I should say that this is, at this point, this is like the maximum voltage. So we could treat this just as the, as, as the max. So if I've got on one side, so this is the voltage on side one, I could have something like this. And this would be the case where N2 is bigger than N1. So I have more turns around the secondary coil. So what this means is, is that if I run low voltage into this co coil, and then I put many, many turns onto this one, this guy will see a high voltage. Or I could do it the other way. I could connect this side to my generator, and I could get a low voltage on this side. One of the interesting things is about a transformer, if the transformer is built right, and to build a transformer right, you actually are going, you actually have to um, uh, play the game, um, uh, you play the game a little differently. What you do is you, uh, is because it's hard to put these coils of wire on the same thing, what you do is this. The trick you play is you put a piece of metal here of very magnetic material like iron or something better if you can get it. And so what happens is, is this traps the magnetic field lines. Very few magnetic field lines leave that metal because it likes staying in with those, because this has all, got all these little loops of current in here. So it likes to run through this. Um, you get some leakage, but not much. Um, and so in fact, the field here and the field here are like almost 99% of each other. It's like a really, really good system. So what you do is you pump energy into this side, and so you're pumping, you have to pump current and you have to pump voltage into this side. And on the other side, you get current and voltage. And because there's very little loss in electric field, the energy efficiency here is like 98, 99%. So with a very high efficiency, you can change hot, uh, low voltage to high voltage or high voltage to low voltage. So in fact, what you're doing is you go from, for instance, in this case, it's high voltage, low current to low voltage, high current. In both cases, the power stays the same. Is the amount of energy coming in here is the amount of energy leaving there. Now, why is this useful? Well, as we discussed the other time, sometimes you want low voltages and you have a high voltage supply. This is a common case you have in your house. And so if you look at um, the brick that you use to charge your phone, right? So here's an Apple brick. If you pop it open, I found a case teardown online. If you pop it open, inside there's a circuit board, there's the USB connector, and there's the prongs on the back. This guy right here, if you pop him open, he looks like this. He's coils of wire wrapped around a common iron core. It's a little transformer. Anything you find that you plug into a wall that isn't something simple like a light bulb or a toaster has a transformer. Any piece of computer equipment, anything else, somewhere in there, there's a transformer as part of the supply. And what this guy's job is, is to bring you from 120 volts down to the five volts that's used in the charger. Now it also takes it from AC to DC. And for that, you have all the circuits and to keep it flat and to keep surges out. And there's a whole bunch of other things this guy does, which is in fact, insanely complicated. These guys are actually really sophisticated devices made for very cheap. Um, but part of it in any teardown you'll do of any voltage supply is one of these guys. And that's for the various obvious reasons that your phone likes five volts. Its battery runs on something like, like a couple of volts or four volts. And so it needs about five volts to charge its battery. But 120 volts are coming out the wall. Well, why do we have 120 volts coming out the wall? Why don't we have like uh, five or six volts coming out of the wall? Well, the problem with that is, is that if, if, if you want to run a light bulb, and so you have five volts and you have uh, a power, let's say, of 100 watts, like an old style light bulb is a hundred, makes hundred watts of energy. If I have five volts, that would mean I'd have to have 20 amps of current. Now 20 amps of current is a heck of a lot of current. To have 20 amps of current running through a wire, I'd have to have a very, very thick wire to keep the resistance low. If the wire was too thin, that's a lot of current running through a wire, right? So remember that the power loss through a wire is something like I squared R. So if I increase the current by a lot, that means I'm gonna get a lot 
of more energy being wasted in the wire. So the wire will get very hot and that'll burn down your house and also waste energy, right? So if I'm moving energy from place to place, I want low voltage, uh, low current, high voltage. That's great for moving stuff through wires. But at the other end, I usually want to have high current, low voltage because that's easier to work with in a phone or a light bulb and it's safer. So our power grid, the power grid of any country looks something like this. You've got a power plant somewhere in Ohio. These are mostly coal burning power plants. The coal is burned, it heats up water, the water is turned to steam. Steam is run through the turbine. The turbine makes it spin. The spinning thing is connected to a coil in a magnetic field. The coil spins around and creates a time varying voltage. The time varying voltage is jet into a step up transformer. So this would have something like 10 turns to 1,000 turns. And so this would bump up the voltage by a factor of 100. You put that through your high voltage transmission lines, the 100 kilovolt transmission lines that we have, the really high tension ones that run from city to city. Then you step it down in your neighborhood and you can run, run that to some primary customers like factories or something like that. Or you step it down again and you run it to uh, secondary customers, uh, 110 and 220, 240. 120 and 240, which is what you have in your house. 240s are usually things like dryer outlets run at 240, stuff like that. One, uh, 120 is the common thing that we have running into our electrical outlets. So what we get out of the wall is 120 volts um, of alternating current. This whole system works because you can do this, you can play this game. You can play the game of just changing how many times you wrap the wire around, and that tells you how much voltage you get out. By wrapping the wire more often, you can get a higher voltage or a lower voltage. Now, energy stays the same because energy is power times, it, power is, uh, or energy is current times voltage. And so as you change one, you change the other. But this lets you move it around between form that's more convenient. This is vitally important because this is like the core of our industrial society right here. All works through this, through this idea. So the ideas we're working with here are not, not important. Okay. All right. There's more practical problems I could give you with transformers. I'm not going to. Um, this is one of the things I want you to understand, but I'm not going to work with very heavily here. I think I have like a little tiny question in the homework on that that basically comes from what we just discussed. All right. So here is the state of play of what we learned about electricity and magnetism so far in math terms. Charges create electric fields. Here's Gauss's law. Charges in electric fields feel a force. This, this plus whoever the other one is down here, that's, that's uh, Lorentz force. Electric fields don't cause loops, which is to say, if I ever have a loop of wire, I don't zero voltage around it. Uh-oh, we just changed that rule. We're going to have to come back to this one. Sorry, this one, sorry, this is, uh, this is the Coulomb force. Here's, here's Gauss's law right here. Duh. I didn't read, my, didn't read my own writing carefully. So this is Gauss's law, that E fields radiate from charges. And also along the way, and this is one of the things I'm skipping a little bit, is that fields store energy. And one of the things I skipped is that magnetic fields also store energy. Um, then we found that moving charges and our currents create magnetic fields. Moving charges also feel magnetic fields as forces. B fields always loop. B fields never radiate. So this is Ampere's law, and this is the magnetic Gauss's law, which tells you that it always forms loops, so you can never, um, you don't have any magnetic monopoles. And then Faraday's law, which is that if I have changing magnetic fluxes, that creates, um, that creates uh, EMFs. This should be, this should be epsilon, that should be curly E. All right, so this is our body of knowledge so far. So what I want to do today, maybe the beginning of next time, is I'm going to take this and I'm going to bring it to the next level of stuff. And that is two or three of these things need to be, need to be adjusted because we haven't got completely the whole picture. And it's stuff we've been basically glossing over a little bit. And so now, basically I've lied to you several times. And so now I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell you what I lied to you about. We have to do that because if we tell you the whole story, right? If I flash this up on day one of this course, everyone in the room would just fall 
over, right? I mean, there's no question. I, you showed me this when I was a first year student. I would have just said, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm not doing this stuff, right? But by walking through it carefully, we should, you guys should all be able to understand what each one of these equations says now, right? The, not all of them are useful. Not all of them are easy, but every one of them is something that we've dealt with and can work with. Okay, so here's mystery number one. So mystery number one is, is this. Remember how we started out talking about induction. As I said, let's have a bar of wire and I have electrons in the wire and I'm gonna drag the, elect, drag the wire to the right and let's say I have a magnetic field here. Well, what these electrons are gonna feel is they're gonna feel a force, right? They're going this way. So V cross B is up, but they're electrons. So these things will feel a force downwards, right? And if I have any positively charged particles, they'll feel a force upwards. And so the net result is I get negative charges down here and positive charges up here. And that's what generates my EMF in the first place. So that gives me an EMF between these two positions. That's how we started out talking about this, right? And this is a very easy model to, um, to understand. Matthew's green screen is doing things to my brain. Um, so, uh, and this was fine. And we found the better rule for doing this, this led to our quantification of this rule, right? Of Faraday's law. This led to this, right? But now I wanna just walk through one of these cases a little bit more slowly, right? And, and, and ask some of the difficult questions we didn't ask. So here's a, so here's a question I would have asked a few days ago. Back because of poor decision making, this is the same one I did at the beginning of the hour, right? But yeah, it's gonna be clockwise. Fields into the page and decreasing, so the current, so the current attempts to create more field to compensate, more field into the page means a clockwise current. So it'd be A. Okay, now here's the same question again, but I've changed something. There's no field right here. It's only in the middle of the loop. What you guys think? Okay. Most of you are thinking nothing's gonna happen in this case, okay? Most, most of you are thinking that. Now here's the thing, now I, the, the answer is actually A, is it does exactly the same thing as the previous case. That this and this give you almost, give you the same answer and you can do this experiment. There's ways you can do this that you can, can't, you can ensure that there's very, very little magnetic field out here, but there's a big changing field inside the loop. Now that doesn't make sense, right? I mean, what's telling the electrons to move? What's creating that, e that current or creating that EMF? What is telling it what to move? There must be a mechanism we're not seeing. It can't be that the magnetic field is directly telling the electrons to move because, that, because that in the case we're just doing, the electrons aren't moving, right? There's no, the wire isn't even moving. So, so the rule that we used 
to get this, right, is F equals QV cross B doesn't even apply in this case. And it definitely doesn't apply in this case. There isn't even any magnetic field here. Yet, uh, Faraday's rule still applies. So there's a mystery here. What's going on? I asked you guys this in the warm up, and you know, some of you uh, didn't really understand the question. You thought it had to do with eddy currents, and it doesn't. Um, but uh, please let me go outside. The change in flux induces an EMF in the loop, which induces a current, which is right. That's what happens. That's what we said happens, but that's not an explanation. That's just a description. So what we want is we want an explanation. Now, here's the explanation. And this turns out to be really, really important. Uh, and this is not something, and I'm going to do some math, but the math isn't the important thing. The important thing is we tested it, and it turns out to be true. So we know that the EMF generated is negative E magnetic flux dt. But what is it? What is this? This is a voltage, right? This is a delta voltage. If I, if I look around the loop, it's telling me what the delta voltage is between the open ends of the loop, right? But a delta voltage, if we go back to the definition of a voltage, voltage is what I get. So if I go to the voltage between A and B, it's A to B E dot DL, right? It's what I get is I walk around this loop, adding up how much the electric field is along every step in the direction that I'm walking. And in most conductors, in a conductor, this is, this is, um, this is zero. In a resistor, there's a higher voltage here and a lower voltage here because there's an electric field along that direction. The, elect the resistor built up an electric field, and so it, you have to push the electrons through. You have to push them against this electric field. So I have a difference in voltage between here and here, but not because I have a resistance or anything. So there must be an electric field that's looping around. Let's use red for electric field. There must be an electric field that creates a loop. And since I can put these two as close together as I like, I can wrap it around a few more times to prove it. These, this must be that I'm getting something that isn't zero when I do this, that delta V in a loop is not zero. So E must be making a loop. Now, this is what we said was completely illegal. We started off when we were talking about electric fields, like back in the beginning of time, five and a half, hundred years ago when we started this course, right? Um, I'm having a hard time even remembering the room we were teaching in, right? Is we said, this, this can't happen. I showed you slides and saying, which one of these can be an E field? And I showed you a slide like this. And you said, yeah, that can't be an E field. So I said, exactly right. Well, guess what? Now it's wrong. And the reason is, is this is allowed to happen if things are changing over time. Before, we were dealing with electrostatics. What happens if there's just charges sitting in places and not moving? Now we've got things changing over time. So it turns out, so if I look at this, this thing is the definition of a voltage, which is the same as that. So if I write this guy down differently, if my new rule is going to be, this is that thing, so integral, E dot DL is equal to negative D magnetic flux DT. What's happening is, what's driving my electrons around the loop is that when my magnetic field changes, it creates a magnetic, it creates an electric field. I'm gonna put my other color here. here. So, that is to say, if I have that, that is creating an electric field, that a changing magnetic field creates a loop, a changing magnetic flux creates a loop of electric field. 
Normally this thing never happens and it can't ever happen if all I've got is charges that are just sitting there. If I've just got like some charges, right? I can never generate a loop of electric field, but now I can. If I've got a changing magnetic field, around that changing magnetic field becomes an electric field. In fact, the electric field shows up here as well, and it's weaker out here, right? This rule is a difficult rule to work with. One thing is you move on in physics, um, we find that these, this is an integral notation, and integrals are the first way we teach it. It actually turns out to be one of the hardest ways to deal with mathematically. It's one of the easiest ways of, of showing you the idea, and this has got a physical meaning. This is a voltage, so that's useful. But um, this is actually a very hard way of discussing the idea. When we get to, if you take electricity and magnetism, which is a two-part course further up in the physics chain, we do this again, but we do this with much, much more elegant notation, but you have to learn more math to write it down more elegantly. This is, this is ugly, right? This is, a, this is a really, really ugly expression that's hard to understand, but it's still true, is that Changing magnetic fields create electric fields. So this is in fact the real version of Faraday's law. The real version of Faraday's law is that, or the real version of looping fields is we got to cross off this guy. E fields don't loop. And the answer is, okay, E fields loop, but only if there's a changing magnetic field. So that's the new version of Faraday's law. So we go, we go from this, to this and these in fact mean the same thing. All I've done is uh, all I've done is I've just changed instead of a voltage, I'm putting in the definition of voltage. Again, the reason we know this isn't because the math says so. The reason we know this is because you can do an experiment. You can get an electric field meter and put it near a loop of changing. Uh, you put it near some mag magnets that are changing, and what you see is you see an electric field there. The easiest way of measuring that is to put a loop of current and to see the current is to put a loop of wire and see the current move through the wire. But this is how it really works. This is the underlying stuff going on behind the scenes. So when we started this whole thing, remember I said, and we started magnets, and I said, if I bring a charged object near a compass, what'll happen? And the answer is, well, not nothing really, because electric fields and magnetic fields aren't the same thing. And they aren't, but they talk to each other. Magnetic fields talk to your electric fields. That's what this is telling us. If I have a changing magnetic field, it creates an electric field. So if magnetic fields talk to electric fields, maybe electric fields talk to magnetic fields. And that's the next topic. And so this is the last hole we're going to fill in in our knowledge of electromagnetism. How are people doing with me? Is everyone hanging in there? All right. Final push. I think we can do this right now. There's two questions, there's two or three questions on today's lecture and the homework. None of them are very hard, but I've covered everything you need and I've covered everything you need to do. Okay, so new topic. Ampere's law. Which way is the magnetic field going to be right there? So I put my thumb along the current, my fingers curl over like this. So at the bottom of the page, I'd have to point into the page. That's the direction of the magnetic field right there, right? Okay. That looping of current was Ampere's law, that if you have a current, it creates a loop of, it creates a loop of field. So there's a loop of field that runs around like this. And this is how we solved the problem, is we said, okay, the field at all of these points has to be the same because they're all the same distance away from the wire, and so everything's the same about them. If you turn the whole thing, rotate it, it looks the same, so they all must have the same value. So that means the B field has to be the same everywhere. So B times the total length comes, gives you mu naught times I, so that tells me what the magnetic field is, right? the strength of the magnetic field is right there, and the right-hand rule tells me which way it is. Right? This is Ampere's law, all right. So now what I'm gonna do is now I'm gonna mess with it. So I've got this system, we all agree there's gonna be a magnetic field there. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break my wire and I'm gonna put a capacitor in there. The capacitor is charging. That is to say it's getting more and more positive charges here and more and more negative charges here. What's going on?
some A's, some B's, some C's. Okay, haven't heard from Matthew in a while. Matthew, why do you say C? I'm not really sure, I'm just guessing. You're just guessing, okay. Somebody, somebody have a better answer than I'm just guessing for C. I would say that it's, there, there's a gap in the wire and every other time, like you can't have a current if there's a gap in the wire right. traditionally, um, right. unless something has changed, which is why I'm slightly uncertain. Yeah, right. So, so that rule I had is when we were discussing DC circuits, circuits where nothing changes over time, right? And in fact, we skipped a whole section on capacitors and resistors, RC circuits. And so we haven't covered this yet, but if I'm getting more and more charge on this left-hand side, it has to be coming from somewhere, right? So I must be losing electrons, right? And the electrons can't jump this gap. So the electrons must be going out to the left here. So if I have electrons going to the left, which way is my current? To the right, right? So some of you, I think some of you said left because the electrons were running out of it. And that's true, that's the motion, but current is opposite the charge of the things that are moving. So this is a current to the right. So this arrow is drawn correctly. So there's current running in. I could also get this if this was all fluid and this would positive charges running through this fluid and building up in this pool over here, right? But let's also say I've got negative, more and more negative charges on the left. So what's happening in the right-hand wire? Right? This is also going to be to the right. I've got electrons, up the current is to the right. It's draining positive charge off that plate, or it's pumping negative charge in. Negative charge is moving that way, I mean, this plate's getting more and more negative. So if I have this Q equal to that Q, then the current on the left and the current on the right are the same thing, right? I'm pumping current in and I'm pumping current out. And that's how you charge up a capacitor. So this is the one case in which I can have current, but a gap right, is if something's getting more and more charged, which it wasn't the case we really con were considering when we first discussed circuits, is we didn't con discuss a capacitor charging up. We only can discuss if the capacitors were charged or uncharged. We didn't have them changing. So as the capacitor charges, I'm pushing charge in on this side, and I'm pulling positive charge out on that side, or I'm pushing negative charge in on this side, and I'm pulling negative charge out on that side. Okay, so I've got a gap in my wire. Does this logic still hold? Do I still have a magnetic field right here? Survey says, survey says yes. And it's true, there's a current running, so there has to be a magnetic field here. Now here's the, here's the important question. This is the question that leads to the interesting answer. Is there a magnetic field there? What would you guess? So some A's and some B's and some C's. So one question is, is whether there's any current running from here to here. So here's the question. Does any piece of charge leave this plate and arrive on this plate or vice versa? No. That would be a, that would be a spark. It would, that, would, that would be sparking, right? But that's not happening. I'm pulling, pushing some charge in here and I'm pulling some charge off here or vice versa, right? 
but the charge is traveling down these wires. No charge is actually separating this. In fact, we could put a piece of plastic in between here, right? And in fact, we do that in real capacitors. And you know that there's no electricity is going to flow across that, across that line. So there's definitely no current there. Is there a field? Now, this is a question. I'm, the textbook, most textbooks try to answer this mathematically, and that's not a real way. The real way of doing it is you go and build this experiment. You build a giant plate here, build a giant plate here. You make it these guys far enough apart so that the fields from this wire and the field from this wire don't, doesn't add very much. And you can work that out by uh, looking at the um, a B. F. Savart law. So you can use the B. F. Savart law to calculate the field here due to this wire and the B. F. Savart law to calculate the field due to this wire. And what you find is if these plates are very far apart, that doesn't actually make very much field. That most of the field comes in the previous case, most of the field that you see at point P is coming from the little bit of wire that's closest by, right? Mo this is the bit of wire that's really creating most of the field. This bit of wire and this bit of wire aren't really helping very much. So the answer is that when you do this experiment, yes, you see a magnetic field here, and the magnetic field is exactly the same as the magnetic field over here, right? Wow, okay, this is a new rule. Right? How do I get a magnetic field there even though there's no current? Ampere's law says you have to have a current to get a magnetic field. Well, one thing, one little tricky bit here is what did we mean by punch through the loop? Right? So if I have a bit of wire and I have a loop here, I would could draw a surface on that loop and say, okay, that's, that's what I'm going to punch through. But there's actually nothing keeping me from drawing that surface as a curved, surf, as a curved thing. Like, so if I stretch a piece of rubber across that loop, I could push that rubber in. And that's still a surface that closes the loop, right? Mathematically, that still holds. Why can't I do that? And the answer is just that if I have just a running wire, that works just as well. Because if I have a loop, if I have a piece of wire coming in, that piece of wire has to punch through. But now if I have a gap, I can put that uh, bit of rubber here. And that guy, and so this say, this closed path, well, it should give me the same answer no matter what. And similarly, this closed path here. I uh, this should give me the answer no matter which one I use. So this leads to this idea that maybe whatever this magnetic field in those two places should be the same. So it turns out that that's true. Now, there isn't any actual current dropping running across that, but there's something that acts like a current. So if I have... I have these plates here. I've got something like a, that acts like a current here. This is going to, I'll call this I through. This is kind of like an I. It's, it's not really an I because there's no current, there's no current moving, but it, but it gives you the same result. If I work out B dot DL, it gets me the same thing if I use this fake current, if I have this fake current is equal to the real current on the other side. And this name for this fake current is displacement current. That's just a name. It's just a name we came up with. It's like, okay, if I, if I create this number, so if I say there's five amps here and there's five amps here, then if I pretended there was a five amps running between these two plates, I would get the right answer for the B field there. Now, there isn't actually a current there. It's a fake quantity we've come up with to describe what you would need to do to get the right answer. So what's, what is this thing? Like, why is it there? OK, so can anybody guess what the answer is? I've got a magnetic field being created. What's creating it? Does anyone have a guess based upon the, the last section we just did? Magnetic field of some sort. Well, the magnetic field is what's being created, right? So last time we had a we had a, a changing magnetic field created an electric field. Now we have something making a magnetic field. An electric field. <laughs> a, a changing electric field. So if I look at these two plates, right? So if I look at the two, I look at my two plates. This guy's charging up. And this guy's 
negative, right? So if I look at him, he's got an electric field running between him, right? Make sure you be using reds for my electric fields. There's an electric field. Now, as he charges up, that electric field is doing what? What's happening to the electric field as I, as I make these charges bigger? Getting stronger, right? I know nobody wants to turn their mic on. This is, I know this is awkward. I hate calling on people. I've always hated calling on people because I was always the kid that didn't want to be called on, so I hate doing it. So I, I try to do it as little as possible. So um, that's, that's why I like the flashcards is because you can talk to me without talking to me. That's, that's the reason I've always enjoyed that. Okay, so that means the field is getting stronger. Well, last time we dealt with flux. Let's think about electric flux here. If I've got, um, if I've got two charged plates, I know what the electric field is because this is one of these problems we did like a billion times. And that is the electric field is equal to the charge density divided by epsilon naught. Let's uh, draw my epsilon knots, not as curly things, just so we can be clear about it. That the strength of the electric field here has got to do with the charge density. And if we remember what the charge density is, that's Q over A over epsilon naught. And in fact, how we got this is we got this by doing Gauss's law. What we did is we drew a, um, a pillbox with area A, and we said that Q over epsilon naught is equal to the uh, E dot dA, which is the flux. And so that's how we got Q over epsilon naught equals E times A, which is the same thing as up here. But this is the same thing as the electric flux. Okay, so Q is equal to epsilon naught times the electric flux. But Q is changing in this case. Q is now, so I got positive Q over here and negative Q over here. So as we go along, this Q is changing. How much is the Q changing? Well, it's changing with the current, right? I've got a current coming in, which is equal to dQ dt. That's how much, how many coulombs per second is piling up in the left plate and how many coulombs per second are getting leaving the right plate, right? So I'm getting like one, so if I have like two amps, then that would be, two coulombs per second extra here, minus two coulombs per second from over here. I'm pumping charge in on the, right, on the left and pulling it out on the right. So that's what this is. So if I, so, So that's the charge on the plates. So my fake new displacement, which gives me the same, which should have the same value as my original current, that is to say, right, if I have I here and I have I here and I here, so the real I, the real I is here and here and I have this fake current in the middle. I know that this and this have got to have the same value because I get the same magnetic field. So this fake I is equal to d by dt epsilon naught electric flux. Well, this is a constant. This is just the, this is, this is a constant of space. So that can come out. So what this tells me is I'll get the right answer for the magnetic field if I do that's the case if I have a wire or if I have a gap This is how I can calculate what's happening in the gap. So, so it's this if I have a wire punching through my, through my loop, and it's this if I don't have a wire punching through my loop, I can calculate 
how much current must be going into charging that capacitor by looking at the electric field. And if I can look at the electric field, that'll tell me how much current must have been punching, must have been going in there. And so that tells me what it is. But what this is telling me the story. If I have a changing electric field, so this is over time, then this creates a magnetic field See, it's going that way, so it should be across, yeah. So, uh, so up and back, down and up. Let me, let me draw that again, let's get this right. So, it's down in front. And up and back. So I have a changing so to write down the complete law I could have I could if I have a changing field that creates a magnetic field if I have a, if I have a current that creates a changing magnetic field so I can write down so here's my final version of Ampere's law mu naught times I through plus mu naught epsilon naught d electric flux dt. And that's our final version of the rule. And we have finally, at this point, with a mad dash towards the end, I have finally reached the final version of all of the rules of the road. So rewrote this one. That was the last thing I did with uh, looking at the loop with a changing field. Actually tells me this. And this, B fields always loop, and they always loop, but, they can, but the loop can be created by currents or it can be created by changing electric fields. These four rules, four of these rules are so important we label them as a special category and a and a physicist a mathematician called James Clerk Maxwell at the end of the at the end of the 19th century so in the late 1800s he put together four of these in a very elegant notation he put together this one and this one and this one and uh, this one this is gauss's law gauss's magnetic law this is Faraday's law, this is Ampere's law. Those four laws together, we call them Maxwell's equations because he's the guy who put all of these, who, who took all of these facts, which were coming from the experimentalists. They were discovering that there were fields here and there weren't here and there were fields only if you changed something or turned it on or turned it off or varied it. But they came up with all of these little disparate facts. And it took people like 100 years to put this together. And Maxwell was kind of the guy who took it the last mile. He realized that those four rules together told a complete story. And those are the Maxwell's, and so those are Maxwell's equations. So here they are sort of graphically. If I have a field, it if I have a charge, it creates a field. If I have a current, it creates a magnetic field. So, so a charge creates an electric field, that's the red. A current creates a magnetic field, which is the blue. If I add up the electric field, it's zero if there's nothing changing. But if, there is a, but if there's a changing magnetic field, it does create a loop of electric field. Magnetic fields loop all the time if there's a charge, if there's a current nearby, or they loop if there's a changing electrical field. Okay. Now there's a very natural question here if you put these guys together, especially this, this guy and this guy, right? And this is, hopefully this has occurred to everybody in the room by now if you've been paying attention to the main highlights here. And, and, and let me say, this stuff is not easy. I've basically described the whole thing to you, but it's a head turn, right? But here's the thing. I know if I have a changing electric field, that creates a magnetic field. And I know, well, I should put a minus. Uh, I'm changing, yeah, I got that right. 
And I know that I've, no, sorry, this is not right. I've got to have mu not epsilon not. And I know that if I have a, I can get an electric field by having a changing magnetic field, right? So this is, this is what causes the generator or the transformer. And this is due to the displacement current. And that's Ampere's law. Okay, I know you can't read that. I'm just, I'm just running it to remind myself what to do. So changing electric fields create magnet, create static, can create static electric field, can non-changing magnetic fields. But it depends on how I'm changing this guy. I could vary the rate at which I'm changing him, which would vary the magnetic field. If I have a varying magnetic field, that can create an electric field. And if I'm varying the rate of change of this guy, that could also create a changing electric field. So a changing electric field makes a magnetic field. Changing B creates an E. Changing E creates a B. Now this would seem to be, now there's a couple of different reactions I think people have at this when I ask them about them. And one is, well, this is a problem, right? Because it, because this would mean that you can suck energy off of it and it's just gonna go somewhere. It'll just keep looping. It'll just keep, it'll just keep going somewhere. And the answer is absolutely. Now, some of you may have already guessed what I'm getting at. Does anybody have a guess what this is? Anybody got a guess? Is it an electromagnet? It's not quite an electromagnet. So an electromagnet is just um, is just uh, this is not even this guy. It's just that's just a current running through a wire. Nothing's changing over time there. So that's just current creating a magnetic field. Is this the electromagnetic waves? This thing? is electromagnetic waves. That's what you can do. Is if you have an E cause a B cause an E cause a B, right? I have a a B and it's changing, so it creates, so it creates an E. So that's changing, so it creates a B, and that's changing, so it creates an E, so that's changing, so it creates a B. This can propagate out into space. And what you get is this. So you have the red is an electric field and the blue is a magnetic field. And to get this electric field, you have to set up a, a wire with current running up and down it. So you have charges being jiggled up and down. And this is, this is not a hard situation to set up. And so if you do that, the changing magnet electric field creates the changing magnetic field, which creates in the space nearby a changing electric field, magnetic field. And these two guys are coupled. You can't have one changing without the other changing. And so they propagate along each other. This is an electromagnetic wave, which is another word for light. So this is, I want to put big neon flashing lights here. Okay, I'll turn off my, turn off my screen share. Big flashing neon lights. This is the point of this course is light is made of electricity and magnetism. This was the massive breakthrough at the end of the 19th century. This is what Maxwell discovered, is that this is must work. This led to work by Marconi, who developed the first radio, which is also another form of electromagnetic waves. In fact, electromagnetic waves are a whole bunch of different things. They're uh, depending on how rapidly this guy varies up and down, or, or how, what the wavelength of the wave is. How fat the wave is. Do you jiggle it up and down fast? That makes a short wavelength uh, over here. It, um, and you can jiggle it up and down slow, which makes a long wavelength over here. Long wavelengths are radio waves, or short, wa or short wave, or microwave. In some region, 
our eyes are sensitive to electromagnetic waves. There's chemicals react when electromagnetic waves hit them, which can activate neurons, and that works in your eye, and that's the light we see, is the stuff jiggling at a certain frequency. If it's higher frequency, we can't see it because it's in ultraviolet. If we go up a little bit higher, we get X-rays or gamma rays. All of this is the same stuff, and it's all governed by the rules we just learned. This is the place, to me, where physics becomes magic, is by learning about rubbing little bits of rod with bits of rabbit fur, we now understand light coming from the sun, that these are two aspects of the same interconnected phenomena. We've got these four Maxwell's equations that describe it, but really how physicists think about it is that these are four aspects of one single thing we call electromagnetism. Electricity and magnetism aren't the same thing, but their equations are all coupled together. And so we actually think of them as being uh, sort of one unified phenomenon. In fact, this is where unification comes from when you're talking about physics. We now understand electricity and magnetism as being two parts of a single phenomenon, which we can see separately from each other, but when you put them together, but when you do, do it in a certain way, you can see them together. This is also a big part of relativity, what Einstein studied, because and this is a little bit head tippy, if you think about an electric field being made by a charge and the charge is moving, that creates a magnetic field. But who's moving, the charge or you? This also leads to a lot of math in here and is one of the reasons why Einstein got his Nobel Prize is he could take Maxwell's work and he changed it into what happens if you look at this whole thing while you are moving. That is far too deep to go into right now, but it's part of what this big surge in physics around 100, 120 years ago was we figured this stuff out. And suddenly something that had been a mystery since the time of Aristotle was connected with other things that had been a mystery since the time of Aristotle. And we can see them now as all part of the same thing. Okay, we have now covered basically everything for the homework. So the entire homework set, we've now covered all the material on for the home for homework 10. Um, I was going to have a deadline on that, like in the, like Friday, to give you guys time to work on it. Okay. And the next homework will be homework 11, and that'll be the remaining two weeks of stuff that we're going to do. And so we're going to cover that. And I don't know what even order we're going to cover that in. Okay, today was a lot of work. Thank you for staying a few minutes extra, um, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for hanging in there with me.